And I arrived on day one to find a room designed for a lecture-based class, rows of chairs bolted to the floor, facing forwards that students couldn't even turn or move their chairs to face each other if they'd wanted to. As you might imagine, this was not exactly conducive to flowing discussion, and it became increasingly stressful to me as a first time TA when the traditional icebreakers didn't manage to shift the classroom's impersonal atmosphere and hierarchical setup. This was when I created an activity I call Plague in Medicine, an immersive text-based game that I will describe in detail a little later on. It had the desired effect, allowing students to connect with each other in a relaxed setting. And though the room remained an, an impediment to easy discussion, it no longer stood in the way of us developing a sense of community while learning. From this one activity, I've expanded my particular style of teaching, which I call resonant pedagogy. Once this shows up, there we go. Today, I will discuss with you the foundations of this, this way of teaching, as well as the framework I use to structure the types of play and games I integrate into my teaching across the duration of a course. In cases of interest, this pedagogical strategy will also be described in depth in a chapter which will be included in a Brepholz volume on teaching the Middle Ages to be released next fall, edited by doctors Emma Wells and Claire Cannon. Gamified education and gamification strategies are growing in popularity, with seminars on how to gamify your lesson plans added to programs like the University of Toronto's Advanced University Teaching Preparation Certificate. There's also growing literature in this area, with walkthroughs of how to LARP lessons and integrate tabletop games. However, these discussions have the tendency to section off specific techniques and activities, creating isolated fields such as game-based learning versus gamification, digital pedagogy, radical empathy, and problem-based learning. Eventually, it can start to become unclear how these methods can be integrated into a broader pedagogical structure. Gamification in particular is connected with the addition of game mechanics, such as winning and losing, points and levels. That's why I call my style of, play, of teaching playful rather than game-based or gamified. Playfulness is a concept that is individually expressed and hard to define. When researching playful teaching, most of what I found is centered on early childhood education. The material that does discuss higher education includes conflicting definitions, such as there you go, an activity that is not work. Also, play is not a specific behavior or activity, such as that one can point at it and label it work or play. Still others have said that it's what children and young people do when they follow their own ideas and interests in their own way for their own reasons, balancing fun with a sense of respect for themselves and others. And play is an informal and contextual mode of being in the world with its own rules and autotelic function. Playfulness occurs when play encroaches on situations where it was not specifically invited. So the definitions of play are, are kind of mutable and various. When the emphasis is gamifying the classroom or an activity, what ends up being foreground is the material or the method of delivery. Aiming for playfulness puts the student first, and that helps surmount stumbling blocks that often crop up with gamified teaching. The concern I've heard the most often is that students won't buy in, and they will actively confront the idea of playing and respond to it as a form of condescension or infantilization. And this is where I believe playfulness is key. These questions and issues of why often appear when the game feels incongruous to the classroom style or to the goals of learning. Essentially, the students need to feel that they are playing with a purpose. And each student, regardless of area of study or cultural background, needs to be able to feel welcomed to bring themselves to the activities and through this to the broader classroom. This is the foundation of my style of resonant pedagogy. To explain how this teaching style is applied, I will first describe the pedagogical goals, excuse me, and then walk through the three scaffolds of the technique, providing examples of playful and game-based activities that I've incorporated at each stage. And sometimes they'll involve you. Resonant pedagogy is a form of immersive, engaged pedagogy that incorporates scholar and activist Bell Hooks' call to action. The professor must genuinely value everyone's presence. Students have to be seen in their particularity as individuals and interacted with according to their needs. I chose the title resident for a few reasons. I wanted to limit any immediate associations with the words play or game to avoid the automatic assumptions and expectations that are often tied to those terms. Resident also avoids connections with other terms like empathy or soul, which can alienate students who are not religious or who do not experience empathy in the same way or to the same degree as implied. Primarily though, 
Resonance was chosen because of its metaphorical and scientific definitions, the power to evoke endearing images, memories, and emotions, and the reinforcement or prolongation of sound by reflection from a surface or by the synchronous vibration of a neighboring object. To explain what I'm aiming for, picture the classroom as a choir. The instructor addresses the group, singing a single note to establish the pitch for the class. The note offered by the instructor in the form of a question, idea, activity, or piece of information resonates with each student according to their own internal melodies, so their life experiences, and they respond with their own harmonies through questions and ideas. When engaging with these harmonies, the instructor's note changes, which will in turn inspire new notes from the students and so forth, giving the instructor the secondary role of co-singer. The hope is that eventually the students will remember not the original note, but the overall harmony and the way their personal internal melody has changed, learning through a process of integration. If this succeeds, what I call a resonant community is created. Some students may not harmonize right away or at all, but their presence in the resonant community means their own internal melody will still resonate and with encouragement they may join in. This analogy foregrounds the student experience because depending on the musician, music can be fun or stressful, playful or painful. Most importantly, it is the notes themselves that convey, it is not the notes themselves that convey meaning, but the way they are sung. If we encourage our students to sing with their own unique voices, developed through a lifetime of experiences, we'll have a richer, fuller, and more authentic song. For this to occur, as instructors, we need to ensure that our students trust the educational environment and enter lessons unafraid of ridicule and with the comfort to make mistakes. In this way, they can be empowered to bring their full self into the conversation. This is especially important for marginalized students who enter academia and encounter, and I quote from an article, so few scholars of color and non-normative bodies, unquote, and often do not expect to see themselves reflected or reflected positively in the medieval sources or other historical sources under investigation. To put resonant pedagogy into practice, instructors need to engage with the four types of resonance that are constantly at play in the history classroom. I have defined them as teacher content, student student, student teacher, and student content. Teacher content resonance functions as an underlying interaction that is ever present in the minds of history instructors as we evaluate how our own life experiences and perspectives are entering the historical narrative and the lessons we are teaching our students. The other three residences are highlighted in different ways during immersive activities and related discussions, depending on where in the course structure these activities occur. So now to get to the framework itself. In the early stages of the term, I incorporate activities that emphasize student-student resonance and student-teacher resonance, with student content resonance being addressed in a secondary fashion. To accomplish this, I use activities that are straightforward and incorporate key elements of play, silliness, low-risk tasks, freedom, flexibility, and potentially humor, either alongside or followed by historical discussion. The, to the topics covered do not need to be lighthearted to manage this, as I'll show momentarily, but the ultimate goal is to create a low-stress environment that allows students to foster relationships with each other and the material without the risk of being marked down or giving the wrong answer. To make this work, I actively take part in these activities, since to be a successful co-singer, I need to consistently participate or else become unable to respond to the students' harmonies. Joining in also indicates that I'm willing to make mistakes and to think creatively about the material, which will encourage the students to do the same. This is the beginning of the resonant community, where a sense of trust is established, which I am then able to work to develop and nurture throughout the course. The secondary position of student content resonance comes into play during post-activity discussion and debate, about the historical content that they've engaged with during the activity. And this emphasizes to the students the purpose of playing. So I'm now gonna show you two examples that I use at this stage in the course, one that requires more technological underpinning and one that can be done with no additional tools. The first of these activities is the game I mentioned earlier, Plague and Medicine. If any of you have ever read a choose your own ending book before, you'll recognize the structure of this game very quickly. For those who haven't come across this format before, essentially you as the reader proceed through the story as in a linear fashion until you come to two choices, at which point you have to turn to one of two pages to select a direction for the story. That is the foundational structure of this text-based game, which was made in Twine, an online open source non-linear story creation software. 
You play as an unnamed merchant during the Black Death in the 1340s, in 1340s Florence. Then your only goal is to try and live your life that day. To best demonstrate how this works, I'd like to play a few frames of the game together in the same format that I use with my students. So before we begin, I'd like you to pick a motivation for getting through the day. This could be love, survival, personal gain, whatever you wish. And if you could put some ideas for that in the chat, we can proceed. So I'll wait to see a few ideas in the chat, see what motivation we pick to continue with. Oh, we've got survival, we've got comfort, we've got love. I we saw survival first. Let's go with survival. Survival, interest, and we saw it twice. So perfect. Go with survival. And interestingly, so I've run this game for about six years now, and seeing the students respond to it pre-COVID, during isolation, and now in this transitional stage. Before COVID, we got a lot of initial responses for motivations that were things like spite and just causing wanton destruction. And then during COVID and now, it's survival. It's almost always survival that comes first. So it's interesting to see how their their lives are now impacting the game. But all right, we're going with survival. So keeping that in mind, I'm going to quickly switch my slideshow. There we go. So we can play. I wanted in case in case the internet went out, I wanted to do this without risk. There we go. Can you see this other slideshow? So give me a thumbs up or yeah, perfect. Great. Thank you. All right. So I'm going to read out each page and then you can select your answer. So just say A or B in the chat. And again, I'll see what the most common one is. We can go from there. So to begin, Florence is currently in the grips of the Black Death. When you're ready, it's time to wake up. And in the game, anything in blue is a select is selectable content. And all quotes from historical sources are marked with an asterisk. You'll see one during our section that we're going to play. Good morning. You stretch and feel your back pop as you rise from your bed and move through the rooms in your shop. Slowly you eat and dress, listening to the eerie silence of the air. The bells have stopped now by order of the town. Fear only hurts our chances, they say. You don't know. It seems almost worse without them. It's like time doesn't exist anymore. Makes sense, you think to yourself. There's no time at the end of the world. And you start the day. Sighing, you realize you are supposed to deliver a commission to Andrea, a 90-year-old woman. Do you A, take the commission, or B, drop the commission and stay home? What do you decide to do, A or B? Oh, wow, almost unanimous consensus on A. One person says B, but we're going to take the commission. Oops. Sorry, let's go back one slide. A, take the commission. There we go. Taking up the garment, you make your way through the streets. The sound of your shoes rings out against the stones, and you pass lanes where the clatter of carts is swiftly replaced by the shouts of merchants, and sometimes by deathly ringing silences. When you reach those, you hurry past as quickly as you can. When you arrive, Andrea's attendant greets you, her voice hushed. The mistress is sick, she tells you. You can leave the dress with me, though I'm sure she would be overjoyed to see you. Do you A, visit her, or B, leave the commission with the attendant and go? Oh, Giovanni, being in Florence, I, did, I can understand why that would be a little, a little terrifying. All right, B. So we're not going to meet her. We're just going to leave the commission with the attendant and go. So we're being risky a little bit with our survival, but not extremely risky. There we go. Well, we finished the game fairly quickly. This was well, this section of the game. I wish I could stay, but I must be on my way, you tell the attendant. She takes the dress with a smile, and you quickly leave the house. You begin to make your way home, but haven't gone far before you run into your friend Christiana. So normally now you would make the choice either to embrace your friend or, or to smile and keep a distance. If we were continuing to play, then we would that I would select B for you, but we're gonna leave the game at this point. And I'm going to switch back to my previous slideshow. All right. There we go. Fantastic. Just one more check. Can, can we see this one? Yep, perfect, thank you. All right, so the students, when they play this game, they'll play through in groups, each group with their own motivation and with new motivations each time they finish a run through of the game. While they play, I circulate the room and sit in, acting as the coin tosser whenever their character is in the balance between life and death. So if you catch the play, you have to either call the doctor or the priest and then see what happens. So this way, by taking part in this, I get a sense of how they're responding to the game as an activity and I also get to take part in the playing itself. The game is, for, is designed to foreground student immersion 
allowing them to get as into character in their group as they wish. So to that end, I use a second person point of view. So as you saw, using the title you versus he, she, or they, and providing as little physical and emotional description for the main character as possible, which allows the students to determine their own level of projection. Once the game has been played through at least twice, I gather the students back together and begin the discussion portion of the session. The aim when deploying this game is usually to discuss the integration and importance of sensory and emotional history, or to discuss what makes history history. That is, what is the difference to them, to the students, between the information in this game and that in an academic article, even though both have been presented to them by academics. The game has produced some truly fascinating responses from students when they've been asked to reflect on their own understanding of history as a discipline and their own interactions with the content. Some students went as far as questioning the limits of history as a field and how traditional or non-traditional those limits are. In 2020, one student wrote on the discussion board, the game is written from the perspective of someone in the present trying to capture the emotions of the past, so it might not be, it might not be an entirely accurate or genuine. But then again, isn't all history written after the fact? Does the fact that it doesn't reference specific dates or events diminish its, his, its historicity? Beyond provoking introspective analysis in students, this activity continues to accomplish its primary objective, which is to break the tense hierarchical feeling of a new classroom and get students laughing, cooperating, and more willing to volunteer answers during the following discussion periods. This pattern was borne out again this past week when I met the seven tutorial groups I'll be leading this term. As the game was relevant to course content, in each tutorial I ran the game as close to the start of class as possible. And in all seven groups, the game was met with laughter and focused cooperative engagement. I noticed a marked increase in the number of students who volunteered to answer questions and engage after gameplay. And once the reasoning for the game was presented, students brought ideas and perspectives they had fostered during the game to their reading of other course texts. The second early stage activity that has proved effective in virtual and in-person classrooms is something I call historical Mad Libs. Now, for those of you who haven't heard of Mad Libs before, it was a text-based game that looked like this. Pardon me, where you fill in random words that have been left blank for you in order to continue or to create a humorous story. In my case, the freedom to create is expanded even further. So this activity doesn't require any technology at all. And like plague in medicine, I'd like to demonstrate it with you. Using the format of one of my previous classes where they were reading Machiavelli's Prince or sections of Machiavelli's Prince, uh, I would like to, us to create a ruler together. If you could in the chat, throw out some ideas of what this ruler's name could be. So any name at all, whatever first comes to your mind. What are some options? What's, what's their name could be? Ashley Burpinall, all right. We'll go with that. Oh, and Richard, we'll do both. Ashley Burpinall, Richard. All right, what are their pronouns? What pronouns does this uh, ruler use? You throw out any ideas you've got, first thing that comes to mind. They, them, all right, we'll go with that. They, them pronouns. All right, next, what about the country? What country do they rule? Monaco, fantastic. All right, about the country, what state is this country in? Are they at war? Is it peaceful? What's going on in that country? Rebellion, nice, I've not had that one before. All right, Monaco is having a rebellion against the leader, Ashi Burpinal Richard. And just a few more, what's uh, this ruler's age? How old are they? They're 14. Oh, all right, the rebellion makes a lot of sense. And what's their personality like? Throw a few adjectives into the chat for me. Petulant, all right. Curious, let's go for one more. Rambunctious, all right. Fantastic. And lastly, what are their clothing preferences? What are a few items of clothing they like to wear? Armor, okay. They're ready for the rebellion. Oh, a large hat. Nice. Let's go one more. One more item of clothing. 
and a silk sash. Fantastic. All right, so as a group and boots. All right, we'll add the boots as well. So together we've created our leader, Their Majesty Ashi Burpinal Richard, the ruler of Monaco, who's currently under currently trying to uh, protect the country from a rebellion. They are 14 petulant, curious, and rambunctious, and they like to wear armor, a large hat, silk sashes, and boots. Fantastic. So we've made this character together. Once we have this, so this is with us, once you've got this with the class as well, you can do many things with this character. Uh, you can, I sometimes brought them back across the term as a recurring character who likes to pop up randomly. Sometimes they're secondary characters and other activities. But in this one specifically, what I did is I turned it into a vehicle for exploring the nuances of the reading. The goals are, of course, adaptable based on the uh, readings at hand. But in this case with Machiavelli, what I did is I created short narratives where each class's ruler was asked to solve particular social problems based on Machiavellian principles. So, for example, one of my tutorials created Their Majesty Bob Cletus III, shrewd yet boring 80 year old ruler of war torn Transylvania, who enjoys wearing masks, togas, corsets, and cloaks, and who has been ruling for their words too long. They also described him as having the personality of dishwater. That was the only adjective they used. So with this in mind, I posted this on their discussion board that week. There we go. Your name is their Royal Highness Bob Cletus III, 80 year old ruler of Transylvania. You sit on your throne, legs resting on a cushion to ease the gout in your royal legs. You've thrown a simple toga on over the usual embroidered corset, your grand purple cloak falling down over the chair's carved oak arms. You look out, observing the nobles milling around your grand throne room, while carefully ignoring the smoke drifting by outside your windows. Wars are for the young, and you're tired. You heard one of your subjects call you dishwater yesterday. You can't even begin bring yourself to wonder what that means. Tightening your mask over your face, you ease yourself to your feet, ignoring all the eyes that fix on you as you move to leave. You woke up an hour ago, so you're overdue for a nap. However, just as you begin to descend the stairs, the door to the doors of the hall burst open, and a man with broad shoulders and a very worn apron storms in, pulling someone by the ear. Your majesty, he thunders, this thief has stolen five loaves of bread from me. We're at war, we haven't room for this kind of behavior. He throws the youth to the ground and glares up at you. If you do not punish him, then you are the true plague on this nation. You adjust your crown and look down your covered nose at the pair, fiddling with one of the rubies on your mask. You suppose you should deal with this, but how? In an unprecedented response, although it was explicitly not required of them, all of the students in the tutorial that created Bob Cletus III, who responded to the discussion board, did so in narrative. While the following Machiavellian, uh, while also following Machiavellian principles as required in the assignment. Other groups similarly had a mix of academic and narrative responses on the discussion board and included names from popular culture at the creation of their characters. The openness of the activity allowed the students to bring elements of their lives, such as popular culture and aspects of the pandemic, such as masks, into the classroom, while also engaging with the historical material. Their enthusiasm is displayed in the creativity of their responses, indicating that this activity, which was used in the second week of tutorials, was successful in helping to develop and reinforce a sense of freedom and resonant community. Moving to the middle stage of resonance structure, student teacher resonance takes a secondary position, now foregrounding student content resonance along with student student resonance. It's important to continue foregrounding community connection as it is only through consistency and repetition that students will come to trust the stability of the resonant community, particularly when they have potentially experienced or are currently experiencing high stress academic settings elsewhere in their lives. Relying on the resonant community that has been created, activities at this stage encourage the students to share and examine their opinions together, which will also, also continue to deepen the sense of the classroom as an open, non-judgmental space for discovery and learning. I often use soundscape activities at this stage, where students listen to a recreation of a historical setting or a section of a text they've been set to read and are then prompted to discuss reactions to elements of the scene or text. For example, I've often used my soundscape of an early modern Italian scaffold walk, placing the student as one of the condemned on their way to execution. The students are then asked to discuss questions such as, where is the violence in this? Is there more than one kind? Many have isolated elements of emotional violence that existed alongside the inherent violence of the act of execution. 
When creating the style of activity, I'm applying an immersive technique that has been used to great effect in public history projects such as the Digital Oral Histories Reconciliation Project, also known as DOHR, in its partnership with the Nova Scotia Home for Colored Children Restorative Inquiry. Using recorded oral histories from the former residents of the segregated care institution for African Nova Scotian children that operated from 1921 until the early 2000s, the virtual reality project relies on what the creators term relational presence, a technique which relies on the visitors maintaining a sense of personal awareness rather than inhabiting a character. This creates space for empathy and discomfort while keeping the learners grounded in their own experiences by asking them to emotionally witness the experiences of others. Although this is a very serious topic, the virtual space the project creates can count as a kind of play space because of the imagination and emotional engagement needed to participate in the activity. This kind of second person engagement with immersion can be extremely powerful when brought into the classroom and always needs to be handled with great care. I always ensure that content warnings are explicitly stated and that students understand that they can leave at any point should they desire to. This is especially important because this form of immersion requires decreased agency in the learner. They are immersed emotionally but do not have the possibility of directly modifying or manipulating the content. Agency in their interaction with history was one of the central points my students raised when discussing the plague and medicine game. So when removing it in an activity that implies a similar kind of virtual interaction with increased emotional immersion, it is important to allow space for students to disengage when necessary. Another mid-stage activity that I'd like to demonstrate in more detail requires no experience with sound editing or technology in general. I used this activity when my students were studying the witch trials and had been assigned some case studies and general descriptions for their weekly reading. To apply the readings they were meant to have completed before class, I told them that for the next while they were pro bono lawyers assigned to defend individuals accused of witchcraft. I created three cases for them designed to reflect modern day individuals, while including in the evidence against them aspects of medieval witchcraft identifiers, also adapted as if a medieval witch finder was hearing present day information. For example, Anne, Shad Anne Shadwell, a psychology major at Toronto Metropolitan University, formerly known as Ryerson University, is a known blasphemer. Agnes DeVice, a cashier at Walmart, juggles extremely well. And Alistair J. Fell, a biology student at the University of Toronto, has appeared very irritable for two weeks. And according to his roommate, Ted, he was seen riding a broomstick. But Ted was also the only one not granted Alistair's prophetic knowledge of the exam answers, so who's to say what he really saw? All of these points are real examples of witchcraft identifiers from my students' texts that week. And after deciding whether or not, based on this evidence, the prosecution had a case against their clients, my students were asked to reflect deeply on the actual cases of witchcraft, the implications of gender, poverty, and propaganda. The humor imbued in this activity facilitated this reflection, since it seems at first to be directed upward in the power hierarchy at those who had such ideas of what made a witch and the ability to execute those they found guilty. Then the direction of the discussion changes and requires the students to reflect if they might actually have been laughing at or with those who underwent the trials, and what that means about how we understand these facets of history and how popular culture has reflected them back to us. In the late stages of the course, all activities are student content focused. The resonant community is ideally strong and reinforced, allowing students to openly and easily share ideas and engage in discussions where I as the, leader, as the leader would act more as a facilitator than an active member of debate. Sometimes at this stage, I will launch actual debate-based activities, for example, dividing the class in, uh, to take on characters and debate the French Revolution. But more often than not, this is where I begin integrating popular video games. Now that the resident community is established and my own approach to history and playfulness is well understood by the students, when video games enter the realm of analysis, there is a decreased risk of students feeling that their hobbies or outside interests are being either ridiculed or taken over seriously. Many people seek out historical analyses of their favorite games on platforms like YouTube or Twitch, an online streaming service that allows viewers to watch gamers play, participating in conversations with them in real time through a chat function. Streamers like Ludo History play fantasy and history games, commenting on their accuracy and occasionally bringing on historian guests. 
Bringing these games into the classroom provides an excellent opportunity for engaged immersive learning that reiterates the legitimacy of historical media, as well as the need for critical thinking. Two games that I bring to my students in my tutorials and on my own course on video games and history are Reigns and Astrologaster. Also Reigns, Reigns and Reigns Her Majesty, they're two separate games in the same franchise. In the Reigns duo, you play as the king or the queen of a western coded medieval country, attempting to make decisions that keep the meters that track religion, there we go, society, warfare, and money balanced. If any of them reaches full or empty, your reign ends. To give you a sense of what this game is like and the potential avenues for follow-up discussion, I've cut together a short two-minute clip of gameplay. So while watching this, just keep an eye out for some of the differences in how the king and queen are allowed to rule. It's going to go briefly through reigns and then briefly through reigns Her Majesty, and hopefully the sound will transfer. So as you can see, there we go, there's a lot to unpack here. Right off the bat, a few discussion topics I've used, how Reigns Her Majesty emphasizes the Queen's role in relation to appearance and romance, her lack of political power, and the fact that she's rarely, if ever, offered the opportunity to fight another character. The King, on the other hand, has multiple opportunities to fight other characters, is given many chances to make important political and trade decisions, and loses multiple wives for no given reason. Here she literally says, I'm dying, I don't know why. Also important to mention is how the, of the limited number of characters of color, one of them is selling, in her words, exotic goods, another is corrupt and suggests joining the slave trade, and a third is Asian coded while speaking in gibberish. Granted, all the characters verbally speak gibberish out loud, but the written text is in legible English, and this Asian coded character is also given an extremely deep voice and described with aggressive gestures, appearing to match the barbaric foreigner stereotype of medievalism. It appears that dedicated gamers will start to see elements of commentary, particularly in Reigns Her Majesty, but this selection that I'm just showing you here is taken from the first approximately 45 minutes of gameplay in each game. When asked, students pick up on many of these points of discussion unprompted and also related the Queen's struggles to elements of the historical text they've been assigned, finding where the game reflected a sense of accuracy as well as anachronism. The second game, Astrologaster, is more historically grounded. Astrologaster is a comedy game based on the medieval records of Simon Foreman, an unofficial doctor working out of 16th century London. You play as the man himself, treating patients in an attempt to gain reference letters and become officially certified. In my own course, I use Astrologaster as the foundation for a set of three lectures, religion and reformation, medieval medicine, and entertainment and laughter. 
Discussions of all three have also occurred in my tutorials, as this game provides ample opportunity to discuss the historical occurrences of religious conflict, medical development, and how and where laughter could, and occur, could occur and still occurs. This last point in particular is similar to the point of discussion during the witchcraft activity. So as you can see here, on the left-hand side, the image reads, Simon Foreman cured us of the plague. It is true some details are a little vague, but we know he used astrology and doses of strong water. So what if he be not a proper licensed doctor? And on the right, the introduction for Simon Foreman himself reads, from towns and cities, doctors they did flee, leaving their patients to die in misery. But one brave doctor stayed when all the cowards fled. Might that have been because he was too sick to leave his bed? So you can see, Astrologaster can at times use a presentist idea of laughing at the backward nature of medieval medicine, causing you as the player, and in my case as the student, to laugh at those in the past because of an ignorance that we only perceive due to the advances that we've made since then. Questions of our own power in relation to those in the past can then come under discussion, as well as the effects that can arise from a more presentist mindset. The reason I have and will continue to develop this pedagogical technique is because of the reactions and responses of my students during my time in the classroom. Aside from the energy that they bring to these activities, as I've described, they've indicated both directly and through anonymous reviews that these activities are, and I quote, actually fun and not awkward, which I take as high praise, and also that there was a sense of excitement and play brought to the classroom. Along with increased engagement, I've also seen students' quality of work improve, as well as their knowledge of the readings when they arrive at tutorial. This exact reason why is, of course, individual, but I hope that to some degree, it's because they're excited to come and join the classroom space and want to ensure that they can participate as fully as possible. To me, there are two central elements to this entire playful, resonant form of teaching. First, as I've mentioned, is integration. If these activities and exercises are fully integrated into the long form structure of the classroom, students will not only engage with it, but it'll be easier for them to leave behind the mindset that playing in games are for children and unnecessary in higher, more adult forms of education. Second, I believe, is finding your own joy for the material or for the process of teaching and leaning into it. One of the most common comments I've received over my years as a teacher is that my enthusiasm is evident. I made this choice before I ever set foot in the classroom. I love what I do and I'm enthusiastic about it. I decided that it was important for me to bring that out to my students, to show them my authentic joy in the experience of learning and hope that they might see why it is that I find so much to be excited about. The development of labs like this one only makes me more excited about where the field is headed and what possibilities await future students and scholars in both history and game studies. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ariana. Thank you for the spending paper. And uh, now it is time for the for the questions. Um, if you can, uh, sorry, I'm gonna start my video. If you can write them on uh, on on the chat, I'll read them. Uh, I'll read them aloud. Um, while we wait for the for the for for um, um, for the questions, um, perhaps I can start with uh, with asking one. Um, Please. Um, I was thinking one of the uh, issues, I guess, when uh, um, students interact with uh, um, with the with the with the source material through games mm -hmm. is perhaps to um, to uh, um, the, the the use of the, well the, um, the the use of presentism uh, that how they mm -hmm. um, to what extent they actually use the um, uh, historical uh, uh, knowledge that they acquired uh, uh, perhaps uh, through reading in the game or the extent to which they actually influenced by modern perceptions of uh, yeah. of uh, of the of the past or of the specific uh, uh, topic uh, that they uh, with which they are they are engaging um, mm -hmm. I was wondering yes how do you monitor that or uh, mm -hmm. Um, how do you react when uh, do you think that perhaps uh, um, they, 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 their engagement is influenced too much by uh, modern perceptions that perhaps they are not completely um, uh, justified by by sources and scholarship? No, thank you. That's I love that question. Something I think about a lot when I when I develop each class and when I've worked on this this general structure. 
So actually, the way I address it is by drawing attention to it, because I think what often happens is that the students slip into that mindset and they don't realize they are. So they start bringing those perceptions to the games and to the history. So I make sure that when we're having our discussion portion after, it's like I let them play the game at their own discretion. They can engage in whatever way they wish to. And then when we all come back together, I'll ask them questions like, how do you think, what are the differences between this and your readings for this week? And inevitably someone will say something like, well, I felt very engaged in this. I had a say in it. And then I'll usually follow up with a question like, so how much do you think that your own ideas about the past are coming into play in both the readings and in the video game? And then I'll try to link that into also getting them to recognize that their own biases and perspectives are also going to come into play when they're reading their historical articles for the week. So I really try to draw that out to make sure that they're self-aware when they're doing any kind of historical work. And then sometimes we can go back to the game and talk about, well, how else would you address this? What other perspectives would you bring to this? And so we kind of make that a big focal point of discussion, which I think I think can only really aid them in increased critical thinking as well. Yes, and it's probably something that um, people are not um, as aware of. If they, in a, in a normal classroom, you take for granted yeah. that you know they uh, uh, they they um, read the uh, preparatory reading and they are fully immersed in the Middle Ages, but perhaps their um, this uh, um, presentism does not emerges does not emerge um, as as clearly uh, and uh, through gaming and then uh, through the, the reflection that uh, follows uh, mm -hmm. the, the, the game, probably that's uh, very helpful to highlight um, that issue. Yes, definitely. I see there is a question here in Reigns. Uh, are there any concepts you would like to uncover, but it is uh, poor or even runs contrary to what you might wish to impart? So in terms of um, any topics that may be run, uh, Sorry, I'm just trying to, to make sure I understand the question fully. So in other words, when there might be some concepts that come up in the game that I don't want the students to take home with them, is that kind of the, the essence of the question? Gordon, if you want to uh, explain the question, uh, not in the chat, by by voice, uh, it's, it's also totally fine. Yes, that's... Uh... That's what I'm getting at. Is there anything that actually you think is very awkward or uh, let's say the game down uh, uh, as a history lesson? I mean, it depends on the section of the game that I'm highlighting, because what I'll often do is either take a video of a section of the game or we start from the beginning, we play as a class. Range is an interesting game. So some of the points that I brought up are I think it's important for them to analyze. But the game also has magic, dragons, potions, a bunch of things that you know aren't historically accurate at all. And the students will take to those very easily. But then, of course, that's an extra section added to the lesson of, well, let's address why this is showing up, why is this a trend? So it all, I think sometimes it depends on whether or not you want to be discussing that in your history lesson, whether you want to take the time out to go down that side of, uh, of the discussion. But it really, that's why I'll make sure that I really pick the section of the game very specifically when I bring it to the class. Otherwise, it can derail the lesson. Yeah, I just wondered if they got too hung up in the uh, the magical side of it rather than mm. the historical side of it. They can. I mean, the students will basically. I find. The, I mean, the focus wherever wherever they wish to, but also wherever you're going to lead them. So whenever that that comes up, I'll address it first and just say, you know, as you see, there were potions in that, which of course we don't need to worry about in this discussion today. And then I'll kind of lead them back the other direction. So I'll try to make sure to like dodge and weave through those elements unless you want to make that the focal point of the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. There is another question. What sort of uh, background do you give the students before they do the games? Um, is it just um, a variety of primary source uh, readings or do you mm -hmm. have character sheets or uh, anything like that? Also, do you ever have students uh, come across parts of games that don't want to play and offensive? If so. What do you um, do in those cases? This happens for me in more recent courses and um, which I'm struggling with in my current class. So I'll start with the, the first question first in terms of what background I give the students before the games. So this ranges. So I've got um, two different kind of experiences. One is, is working as a TA, as a tutorial leader, and the other is as teaching my own course, which is specifically on history and video games. In the tutorials, when I bring games in, 
usually it's just connected it's it's connected to the course reading but it's not an assigned part of the course reading so for something like the play game i don't give them any background other than what i gave you so you're playing is this you're doing this and the point of that is to get them to react to the game as viscerally as possible i don't want to give them that much information for something like astrologaster or reigns i'll kind of prep them as much as i can but i still want to get their raw response but in my course the readings range usually what i'll do is the readings will be more historically focused with maybe every once in a while um, an actual reading on the game development as well and then i have them play the games as part of their weekly readings so i'll say play to this checkpoint play to this checkpoint and then they'll come to class and each class is themed so there's a week on gender a week on uh religion and reformation and i'll pick up on some of the issues that might have come up during that portion of the game and i'll integrate them into the lecture itself so no character sheets or anything like that, unless we're doing a more kind of role play style uh, activity in class, because even in the lecture for my own course, even during lecture, I like to be interactive. But yeah, usually it's just primary source readings when they're playing in, in my course and in tutorial, it sometimes just be raw response. And then in terms of the parts of the games, they don't want to play or find offensive. So far, I've not run across that problem myself. Um, when it has. I mean, I always try to leave room for students to be able to come to me when they feel anything like that. I indicate to them right at the beginning of tutorial, right at the beginning of lecture, if you need to leave this class at any point, don't let me know, just go ahead and you do what's best for you. And I've also told them if, if there is anything that you respond to, you know, you, you don't like in these games, come speak to me, we'll see what we can do about it. What I might do is either assign them an alternate section of the game to play, or if there's something else that props up, I try to vet the games as much as possible to make sure that I limit extraordinary amounts of that content and when it does show up that i integrate it into the lesson but if it really came up with a student i would try to find an alternate method of evaluation but which if you don't want me asking which games have you been finding have have come up with with trouble in that area because it might just be that i haven't used them yet well i'm not using video games i'm using uh reacting to the past um so, ah, okay right so it's immersive role playing over several weeks and in my current one i did not mean to by accidentally assigned a black student the character of a slave looking for freedom and she was right. very uncomfortable with that so i ended up having to switch things around but you know because i didn't know names and faces when i put the roles together this is i, I found it's a quite an interesting point so this is partly when i was talking about the soundscape activity that i tend to use this is an issue that's come up there as well so there was one incident where soundscapes were used very in my opinion rather irresponsibly i believe if i remember correctly it was well, it was a university in the States. I can't remember the exact name, so I don't want to throw out a random name and guess. But they integrated an immersive soundscape of a slave market for their drama class. A number of students in that class were Black students. They were told, it's mandatory, you have to sit through this, and were very uncomfortable, very offended, understandably, and released an article. So I think it's just one of those cases where, so yeah, you kind of either adapt on the fly or try to adapt ahead of time. And yeah, it's, it just try to avoid as much as possible, unfortunately. Thank you. Um, any other question? If not, um, I think uh, I thank you for attending tonight our seminar, and thank you, uh, Ariana. Um, uh, gave us a lot of uh, food for thought for the use of uh, of games in uh, in our classroom and. Um, uh, Gordon and I had um, uh, did this experiment with these in the past, and. Uh, um, I'm sure it will be helpful for everyone uh, uh, who attended it. And in fact, there are some messages regarding this um, already. Perfect. Thank you very much. And uh, um, I will um, uh, post uh, these on uh, our YouTube channel uh, shortly. And um, um, so you'll be able to, uh, to see there too. I hope to see you again uh, uh, in the next uh, seminars of the Eastern Games Lab. The others for this uh, semester are not uh, online, they are in person. So if you're in Edinburgh, I hope to see you there. Otherwise, uh, I will advertise the, um, the next uh, uh, semester um, program um, in due course. Thank you very much. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me.